So if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 34. I'll be in Psalm 34 uh, today, Psalm 139 next Sunday, so you can prepare yourself for that. Psalm chapter 34. Again, I think the wording in this psalm, at least some of it, will be relatively familiar to most of you, but we are going to read that psalm together. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many good day, or many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Let's pray. Father, once again, as we uh, find ourselves in the Psalms and uh, in your inspired word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be among us to illuminate these words. Uh, not just for mere understanding, for mere cognitive recognition of what's going on here so that we can spout truth to people, but Lord, that, that those truths captured in this psalm would be, uh, would be lived out by us, lived through us, and that we would take this message of your word to those around us who need it. Encourage us, challenge us, and exhort us. Lord, we pray that you would make us different people leaving than when we came. For the praise of your glorious grace. Amen. You'll notice at the, uh, at the very beginning of this psalm, before verse 1, this is one of the psalms that has a short superscription to it, an introduction of sorts that sets this psalm in a historical context. Uh, most psalms lack a historical context, but this one gives us a very specific one. And it says of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. So we know that it was David who wrote this psalm, and we know that it was at some point after this incident with Abimelech. So if you know your Old Testament, you know that this story happens in 1 Samuel chapter 21 and surrounding chapters. And so it's important for us to understand the context, because it will help us to understand the words of David and where they come from. So at this point in the life of David, he has already killed the champion of the armed forces of Philistia, the, the big man named Goliath. He had already been anointed to be the successor of King Saul, even though Saul was still the king. And he was also the one of whom the women of Israel were singing songs like this. Saul has slain his thousands, but David, David has slain his tens of thousands. So the renown of David, even though he was not yet king, was progressing throughout all the land. Now, if you know anything from the Old Testament and the, and the person of Saul, you'll know that this kind of song would not have sat well with him. King Saul was worried that these kinds of songs and the reputation of David uh, about his already confirmed successor was going to put his throne in significant jeopardy before he was ready to give it up. And so Saul not only became nervous about his hold on the kingship of Israel, 
he became angry. We know Saul to be a little bit of a, a, a finicky personality, a guy prone to lose his temper from time to time. And so he became very upset at David. And he became committed to wiping David out, to killing him, get rid of the potential successor. And so he went on a hunt to try and find David in order to kill him so that he could secure his throne for himself for longer. Now David recognized that Saul was going to do this. And what Saul does, or sorry, what David does is something actually that I still don't quite understand. Uh, he's considering where to go. The king of Israel is after him. And so he's thinking, where am I going to go so that this king is not going to find me? And he figures that, well, the best place to go will actually be to Philistia. And in particular, he's going to go to the town of Gath. Now this is an interesting decision, to say the least. And I'm not exactly sure what was going on in the mind of David, because it doesn't make any sense that David would go to Philistia, and particularly to the town of Gath. Remember, David has just killed Goliath. And in pursuing the army of the Philistines, where does he pursue them to? Right up until the town of Gath. And not only that, guess where Goliath calls home? The town of Gath. So here David decides that he is going to hide from King Saul in the very town from which Goliath hailed. Now, if your hometown is like his hometown, you'll know that he probably had parents there. Maybe grandparents, uncles, aunts. Chances are very good he had a wife that was there. He probably had brothers, maybe sisters. He might have even had children that were there, all grieving his death. And so where does David run to? He runs straight to Goliath's hometown. Now, when you think about it from a somewhat strategic perspective, David may have guessed that since he and his army had killed most of the Philistine army, there was a pretty good chance that nobody was going to recognize him, uh, even if he went to Gath and probably would have been intimidated by him. Right here comes the, the big champion of Israel, the, the, the leader of the Israelite army coming to this destroyed town. You know, he's probably thinking the Philistines are not going to be quite ready to point him out and identify him. So he's thinking maybe there's a bit of immunity in that. And when you think about it, where would the last place on earth Saul would go to to look for David? Right, if you're thinking about it from Saul's perspective, you would think the last place he's going to go is to Goliath's hometown in Gath, where he just left after destroying the entire Philistine army. So, I guess maybe a little bit of that decision makes, makes sense. But he goes to Gath, and as you would expect, there's a few of the advisors of the king there, King Achish, the king of Gath. And they're wandering around the town one day, and they notice this guy who looks awfully familiar. And they go back to the king, and they say to him, you know, I think, I think we see David in our town. I think this is the guy who killed Goliath. This is the leader of the Israelite army. So Achish and the advisors agrees, go and get him, bring him in here. So he does that. And, and they bring him in, and, and David realizes at that point that he's actually in a worse situation than he probably would have been had he stayed in Israel, living outside of Saul's palace. So he comes up with a very interesting plan. Uh, he decides that his only way out of this situation is to act like he's completely and utterly lost his mind. He turns into a madman. And 1 Samuel 21 says that what he starts to do is he starts to drool out of his mouth, so much so that he has spittle going down his beard. Now men, try this at home when your wife doesn't see you to figure out how much you actually need for someone to recognize the spit going down. But not only that, he begins to crawl on the floor, climb up on the walls, and scratch against the furniture. And King Achish looks at him and goes, you guys are idiots. Why would you bring this crazy person to me? Obviously this is not the King of David, this mighty warrior. This is a madman. 
Now, in the ancient Near Eastern world, when you had somebody who was insane or crazy or losing their mind, there was, there was a bit of a, 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 a luck thing involved. It was bad luck to involve yourself with them. So you just kind of pulled back and let them do whatever they wanted to do. They're losing their mind. They're drooling all over. They're scratching. You say, knock yourself out. So Akish says, get him out of here. I've got enough crazy people in my town. I don't need another one. Just get him out of here. And so David at some point realizes his plan has worked. And he gets up, he flees Gath, and ends up in the wilderness. Then he writes Psalm 34. Then he writes Psalm 34. This is one of the nine alphabetical acrostic psalms that we have. Meaning it begins with the, the opening letter of the Hebrew alphabet and then runs itself through. And the reason psalms were written this way, many scholars believe, is designed, it's designed to be memorized. It's easier for, let's say, a young child uh, to memorize this if, they, if all they have to do is, is recognize the order of the alphabet and, and the beginning words, and then off they go. And the reason why certain psalms were written like this, uh, to be memorized, was not just to you know, impress the Sunday school so teachers so you can get a sticker and a little mini Twix bar, or whatever they gave out back then, was... But it was written because it was designed to instruct. This is a lasting message. Now we know that most songs were written for the, the public sphere. They were written for, um, for the purposes of the, of the sanctuary, for the purpose of public worship. And, and the last couple of weeks, Scott took us through Psalms of Ascension. So, so while Israel was making its trek to Jerusalem for their holy days, they would recite and sing each one of these psalms each day as they were going to or coming from. Uh, but this psalm is a wisdom psalm. It's designed to teach us something about God and about how to handle our situations when we find ourselves in a similar situation to David. Hence the superscription. Hence the reminder that, listen, David wrote this psalm in a particular situation so we know that you might find yourself in a situation like him, probably not the, the level of intensity, and when you do, go back to this psalm and read it. When you find yourself in trouble, in trial, in difficulty, in persecution, whatever, remember David was once there too, and that he wrote this psalm. And so remember it. And so the psalm is really simply structured, and as you probably have figured out by now, we've been in the Psalms for a few weeks, and we've been in the Psalms as a church in the past. Psalms aren't like epistles, right? So you can't really just go verse by verse, you know, phrase by phrase, and kind of break it down. It's more thematic, right? There's parallelism in here, it's poetic, and so we're, we're dealing more with themes than we are with anything else. So we've got the theme of Thanksgiving that begins this psalm. And then in verses, like, say, 4 to 10, we have a, a bit of transitional verses as the psalm moves from thanksgiving to instruction, or, or from thanksgiving to the personal situation of David, verses 4 to 7, and then verses 8 to 10 are an invitation to participate in the instruction, and then from verses 11 to following, we have David saying, listen, I'm going to instruct you now, I'm going to give you wisdom so that you can understand the attitude that you need if you find yourself ever in a situation similar to mine. So let's begin uh, with, we'll just walk through the psalm. There's an outline in your bulletin, but I realized this morning as I was rereading the psalm, the outline is largely irrelevant. So we're just going to go through it uh, kind of section by section and pull out what we need to do. So David begins the psalm with uh, uh, three verses of thanksgiving. And he begins it actually with a vow, a promise. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. And so here David begins the song promising to persistently praise God. Now again, remember where David is. Remember what he's going through. Remember what he's gone through. Okay? He's had to leave his hometown He's, he's gone to Gath, he's been kicked out of Gath, and if you go to 1 Samuel 22, you'll actually realize that he is actually holed up in the cave of Adullam. 
Now, I have no idea where that is, but it's a cave, and it's in the wilderness. And so he's writing this song. Picture David as we go through this, sitting in a cave. I don't know if you've ever been in a cave before, but caves are, generally speaking, dark. They're a little bit dank. They're humid. Not exactly a place that we would want to live in. And he's sitting in there, and he's, and he's writing this song. And the first thing he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. I will praise him from my mouth. And he says, listen, I, I'm going to... I'm going to praise God no matter what. It's not based upon a specific event in my life. It's not based on a feeling. It's not based on a certain circumstance. It's not, I'm not going to bless the Lord when I find myself in church or at a worship meeting or whatever it is. No, I'm, I'm going to praise Him all the time. I'm going to live a life of praise to God. And He's not, he's not promising a marathon praise session. Right? Like He's not saying that as soon as I become king, the first thing we're going to do is have 24 hours, seven day a week, praise and prayer sessions happening in the temple. No. He's saying, I am going to live a life that is going to reflect my praise of God. I'm going to live a worshipful life. I'm committing myself to praise God in every opportunity, in every situation, in all my states of mind. Wherever I find my mind, body, and soul, I will praise God. Now, we have many of these kinds of messages that were given in Scripture. We know Paul, for example, says that we're supposed to pray without ceasing. He's not saying have a, you know, quit your job, you know, abandon your family and just, you know, hold yourself up in a closet and pray for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He's saying, no, no, you need to live a life of prayer. Pray consistently, all circumstances. And David is saying the same thing. He's saying, I'm going to praise God and bless God in all my circumstances, regardless of what they are. And so verse 1 stresses the frequency of David's praise. Verse 2 reveals the focus of his praise. He says, I am going to make my boast in the Lord, he says, verse 2. He doesn't dwell on his, his experience. He doesn't dwell even on his deliverance. He focuses on God. He says, my soul is going to boast in the Lord. That's where I'm going to be glad in. I'm going to be glad in Him. And so in that sense, the Lord is both the subject and the object of David's praise. Now again, I think there's some significant lessons, I mean, there, there's significant lessons in all the songs about worship, but in a day and age when so many of our worship songs are focused on me and my experience, I will this and I will that and I will this, David says, listen, you know what, here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm going to bless Him. I'm sitting in a cave. I'm all alone. There's nobody around me. I've just, I've just barely escaped with my life a number of times, and I will bless the Lord that I'm sitting in this cave. And then, and in the second half, verse 2 and verse 3, he says, there, there's something else about praise, about thanksgiving, about blessing that we need to recognize. And let's just, let's call it the, the fellowship of praise, or the, or the community of praise. And so David, obviously, as he's writing the song, he's by himself. So praise can be private. He says, I'm going to live a life of, of praise and worship to the Lord. But it's not the kind of praise that David is asking for us to participate in as we read this song. What he's promoting here is the public blessing and praising of God in worship. He wants to promote worship on the part of the entire congregation, all the people who love God, as David does. He, he says, I want you to magnify the Lord with me. Verse 3, magnify the Lord, exalt his name together. So when, we, when you come together, I want you to have the same attitude that I, that I have. I live a life of praise and worship to God. So when I gather together with God's people, I'm doing nothing different than what I do every single moment of the day in my life. This is just a, a, a different expression of that. And what I want you to do is do the same. right? I want you to live a life of worship. I want you to live a life that blesses the Lord. And then what I want us to do is get together in the congregation of God's people and have this be an extension of that. That's what he's saying. This is an extension of that. And so I want you to rejoice together with me. Now again, we have lots of this kind of teaching throughout the scriptures. Uh, when we return to Romans, in Romans chapter 12, which is going to be, let's see, 6 to 8 before Christmas, and then 7, it's going to be like a year from now, when, by the time we get to Romans 12. Paul says, here's what I want you to do as a congregation of God's people. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. 
No, that's part of worship. That's part of blessing. That's part of coming together. Right? Because sometimes as a group, sometimes you need to sing blessing songs. Sometimes you need to sing songs of lament. Sometimes you need to sing songs and say, listen, I think God is, I don't know about God right now. But then you bless his name together. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so David urges fellow worshipers, join with me in magnifying the Lord. Join with me in blessing him. I want his name exalted when we get together. There, there's essentially what worship should be about. Does it exalt God's name when we gather together? Do you exalt God's name when you're alone? That's essentially the nature of worship and thanksgiving that David is trying to pull out of his circumstance here in the first three verses. As I mentioned, once we get to verses 4 to like 10, we see a transition going on in this psalm. Verses 4 to 7 is David's... Um, for lack of a better way of saying it, it's his, his, his recollection of his deliverance in a sort of a macro scale. He's not going to detail uh, the circumstances, but what he's going to do is he's going to, to describe for us his deliverance. I sought the Lord, he answered me, and, and he delivered me from my fears. And then he says, listen, this isn't just something that happens to me, this is something that can happen to anyone. Verse 5, then verse 6, he comes back to me again. I was a poor person, poor man. I cried out, God heard me. And he, and he saved me. And then guess what? That can happen to you as well. In verse 7. And so these circumstances are the reason why he's so thankful, why he's so willing to bless God in the first three verses. But they're also the circumstances that drive him to the instruction of verses 8 to 10. And so the, the emphasis of verses 8 to 10 is to instruct us, ex instruct others to experience what he has just experienced. So here's, here's basically where he's wanting us to go. He says, I want you to bless the Lord. I bless the Lord because he delivered me. And so what I want you to experience is the same thing. I want you to experience the deliverance of God. And then I want that experience of deliverance to lead you to bless the Lord. And so verses 8 to 10 is this invitation. And the rest of the psalm actually reads more like the book of Proverbs than it does a typical psalm. There's more wisdom literature here than you typically get in a psalm. And so from this point forward, uh, David is going to explain how it is that we can experience and enjoy the protection and deliverance of God. He said, I may have been in Gath and fled to a cave in Adullam. You might be experiencing something completely different. But what he knows is that at some point in all of our lives, we're going to need to seek refuge in the Lord. And he says, I want to help you to understand that. Because I want you to bless the Lord. He wants us to understand, fundamentally, that the protection and deliverance of God is not automatic. Because God expects evidence of our allegiance to Him. David instructs his, li his listeners the way a teacher would instruct his younger students, giving us wisdom so that we would follow in his footsteps. And he wants us to receive from God what he's experienced, so that we can bless and praise, boast, be glad, magnify, and exalt the Lord together. In short, what David is trying to communicate to us is that there is no experience of God's goodness and deliverance without a corresponding godliness within us, or a corresponding uh, commitment of faith, we would say, using New Testament language. And so we have three imperatives in verses 8 to 10. These are three invitations that come to us, taste, see, and fear. Taste, see, and fear. Now, these are not synonyms, but they're not three specific different things either. They're complementary. Remember that when we're dealing with Hebrew poetry, we're dealing with parallelism, right? One phrase and then another phrase, which reflects the first phrase in a number of different ways. And so, taste, see, and fear are all talking about somewhat the same thing. The wise taste God. They taste His goodness. And they do so by taking refuge in Him. 
and they submit to his way of life. They fear him. And so that's the theme of the next section of this song. The wise person tastes God and his goodness, and they do so by running to him every single time that they're in a troubled situation. And in order to find refuge in him, there is the necessity to submit to his way of life. Think about it this way. Okay, in the ancient Near East, or, or think about, you know, medieval times or whatever, you're a, you're a, 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 a refuge, and you're, you're running from a, a troublesome situation. You come to a city, and it's fortified. And there's a guard standing on the gate, or a gatekeeper. And he opens the door, or opens the hatch to the front door of the city, and he says, why are you here? He says, well, I'm running from somebody. I'm fearful for my life. I, I, need, I need to take refuge in your city. Well, the gatekeeper's not just going to say, okay, yeah, knock yourself out. Come on in. He's going to say, listen, here's the, here are the rules that are involved in this. If you come into this city, you need to obey this rule. You leave your sword at the door. You're not allowed to be out after this. You have to do this. You have to pay your this. You have to submit to this, blah, blah, blah. Do you agree to all of that? Yes, you do? All right, in you go. And that's essentially what David is saying. Is that, listen, that the wise person wants to taste God's goodness and will run to Him at all points. But in order to find the refuge you're looking for, you must fear the Lord. You must agree to His terms in order to find refuge. So, what does David say? What are, what are the kinds of things that are sort of the terms to find refuge in God? Uh, how do we find this refuge? How do we taste and find refuge and fear the Lord? Well, there are at least four things, I think, that this psalm identifies. Things that we need to understand, things that we need to submit to, in order to truly find refuge in God. The first one is simply this. The blessed life. Look at verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Okay? The blessed life is not a life free from trial and trouble. You're finding refuge. When you think about it, why do you go and find refuge? Because you're in trouble. And just because you find refuge doesn't mean the trouble has gone away, right? As soon as you leave the, 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 part, the, the part of the, the city, let's say, like in our illustration, as soon as you leave the city, your trouble's back. The trouble is always there. It's where you find refuge that's going to determine whether or not you're safe. And so the theme of trials and trouble, especially given the context of the psalm, are clear. Notice the words in verses 4 to 7. There's fear, there's poor, there's trouble. Like this isn't a guy who, who's, who's experiencing all the good stuff in life at the moment. Then look at verses 17 to 19. The words cry, troubles, afflictions. Now David's teaching from his own life. He knows fear. He knows what it's like to be poor. He knows trouble. He knows what it's like to cry out, to be afflicted. And he knows what it's like to, to suffer deeply. He knows the dread of the unknown. And he knows what it's like to be close to death. He knows what it's like to be hunted. He's experienced rejection. He's experienced loneliness. The life of David, especially at this point, is filled with what we can only describe as some pretty terrible experiences. Think about the ups and downs in David's life. Okay, Think, of, think about your life and the ups and downs you have to deal with. You've got nothing over the life of David. Okay, Here's this guy, he walks out onto a field and he faces this big massive giant. Little kid, little nobody. He defeats the giant. Nobody else could. All these big, tough guys are all cowering in the tents. Nobody wants to take him on. David goes out there, knocks that guy down, chops his head off. He's the victor. Now, if he was like me, I'd be like, oh, who is the man Israel? Right? I mean, come on. You all would think that same thing, right? Look at all of you chickens. Now I'm out here in the battlefield. And then not only that, but now he leads the army. And off he goes. Right? And then he defeats this army, pushes him all the way back. This little guy who knows nothing about nothing. Shepherd boy. Now not to mention, not to mention that he's also killed lions, right? 
I mean, think about it, right? If you kill a lion, chances are you drag that carcass here to church on Sunday. Look what I just killed. Or you'd wear it, right? You'd do something like that, right? And not only that, but David finds out that even though he's the least, the youngest, the smallest of all of his brothers, when, when the, the, the prophet comes along and says, nope, not that guy, not Big Jim, nope, not this guy, not that guy, not that guy, oh, we want a little runt at the end, like, can you imagine what you would be like with your brothers? I'm the king, you're not. Guess who's going to have to bow to me? You will. Right? I would be just like the cloak of many colors, right? Look at my cloak. I'm the king, you're going to have to bow to me. Oh, I had a dream, you're all bowing to me. Why don't you practice, you know? Like, I would have been <laughs> completely unlivable. Right? And yet, where does this guy find himself almost immediately after all that stuff happens? Saul wants to kill him, the king of Gath wants to kill him, and he finds himself in a cave all by his lonesome himself with absolutely nobody in the middle of nowhere. Ups and downs, you ain't got nothing on David. He's experienced rejection, he's experienced the highest of heights, he's experienced the loneliness of the lowest of lows. And he says, I'm still, I'm still blessed. And I will bless the Lord for my circumstances. I will bless the Lord for his deliverance? Are you kidding me? You call living in a cave as the king deliverance? I would be more like Elijah. When he got driven away, and he would, he'd be mad. Right? Are you kidding me? This is what the servant of the Lord gets? This is what the anointed of God gets? He knows what it's like. But he says in verse 19, plainly, he says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. You want to be righteous? You want to be favored by God? Guess what? You're going to be afflicted. Now there's a lot of Christians who have a prosperity gospel mentality, even though they might deny prosperity gospel when it's taught to them. Right? So if I were to begin to teach you and say, you know, this is what prosperity theology says, you'd be like, no, 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 that's not how it works. But hey, most of us think it, don't we? We think, listen, I trusted in Christ as my Savior. I, I am, I'm, I'm doing my best. I'm trying to follow Him. You know, I, I try and have my devotions. I try and pray. I go to church. I, I give my money. I, I help other people when I can. Uh, I'm, I'm doing fairly well. I'm, I'm Decent enough father, decent enough mother, you know, whatever it might be. Um, live a fairly good life, so Lord, a sugar coming my way, maybe? Aren't you seeing what I'm doing here? Look, look, look at what I'm doing. I, 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 and typically that comes with, look at what he's doing. Look at what he's doing. He's a terrible Christian. Right? He wasn't at church last Sunday, he was at the beach. I went to church. And did you realize how hot it was in church last Sunday? I didn't complain. Could have, didn't. I heard somebody else complain. I didn't. Right? We think, okay, Lord, give me limited trials. Give me limited troubles. Make my kids turn out. Uh, make me not sick. You know, just, just help me not to, not, not to struggle through life. And so, then when the trouble comes, and usually it's little stuff, not big stuff, we say, we immediately turn on God. Where is all of this stuff coming from, Lord? See, there are many Christians, I think, who mistakenly think that following Christ means that what he does, he puts us in this little protective bubble, this little protective shield, so that any trial that comes just bounces off. It's like this, this faith force field that just bounces everything off so that we're immune to struggle, trouble, sickness, opposition, whatever it is. But David says, no, 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 the, the righteous are going to be filled with afflictions. And we know this, you know, uh, again, from the, from the uh, New Testament, from the book of Acts, in one of the churches that Paul founded, Acts chapter 14, he tells them, through many tribulations, you will enter the kingdom of God. Through many tribulations, we enter the kingdom of God. Paul, or sorry, Peter wrote to the suffering church in 1 Peter 4. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as if some strange thing was happening to you. So 
So imagine again David sitting in a cave writing these words. And this psalm, if fully grasped, is going to dispel the naivety of that faith which does not contain within it the strength to stand against the onslaught of struggle. The blessed life is not a life free from struggle. In fact, I think if we know anything from Scripture, we know that it's actually going to increase our struggle. There are a number of reasons why we can suffer in this life, and a quick glance over the life of David, and frankly, over our own experiences, we'll just simply identify a number of them. We can suffer on account of our own sin and shortcomings. We know that from the life of David with his whole Bathsheba incident. We can suffer on account of the sins and shortcomings of others. David, again, the sins and shortcomings of Saul, the, the wicked king. Or we can suffer from just being a part of a fallen world. Our world has fallen. It's, it struggles. And there's just bad stuff that happens. But, and this is an overwhelming theme in this song, whether your trials are due to your own sin, the sin of others, or the the simple fact we live in a fallen world, the believer should not let those trials cause you to turn away from God's bitterness. The Lord is good. And we need to remember that at all times. Rather than becoming bitter, we need to let the difficulties of our life push us to the Lord for deliverance. Why would we seek the Lord for refuge if everything is going well? That's David's attitude. We want to live in the refuge of God. And sometimes the troubles of life are what we need in order to find that. We need the attitude of Paul. Paul in his thorn, 1 Corinthians 12. He says, I've prayed multiple times, three times. I've exhorted the Lord. And what does God say? My grace is sufficient for you. And, and that, that's fine. i got no problems with that. It's the second thing that God tells him that gets me. Because my power, God's power, is made perfect in your weakness. See, as Christians, we struggle with that, I think. Right? It's like, I want to bless the Lord. But David says, guess what? If you're going to truly bless the Lord, if God is going to be seen through you, more and more and more, guess what? He's got to make less of you. More and more and more. The less of you, the more of him. Is that what you want? David says, that's what I want. I would bless the Lord at all times. And by simply saying that, he's saying, Lord, what I want you to do is make me weaker. Make me less so that you can be more. I want to be humbled so that you are exalted. I want my name made low so that your name can be made high. And that's David's point in this, in this song. Fear, gloom, depression, whatever circumstances come should never turn the true believer into a grumpy, depressed hater of God. Now, this psalm is realistic in its portrayal of life. Just read it over yourself again and realize what David says about his life. The righteous don't escape trouble because they're righteous. And we're going to find out later because their righteousness doesn't come from them anyway. The way of wisdom assures that those who walk in righteousness, God is going to bring them into his refuge, even though we may suffer many troubles. So we shouldn't complain about our circumstances, but lean on our God, who is our ever-present help in times of trouble. So the first thing that we need to understand about the blessed life, about the life of godliness, is that it, it is not something that is free from trial and trouble. The second thing that, that David wants to teach us in this psalm is that the wisest thing you can do is to fear the Lord, is to fear the Lord. Now the fear of the Lord is, is, uh, is just, it's quite simple to understand. It, it involves fear, uh, it involves recognizing that He is God and you are not, right? It's, it's, it's recognizing those multiple places in the Old Testament when people get confronted with the presence of the Lord, even, even through uh, you know, the back of him or, or whatever, they tend to fall on their face expecting to die. So there's that, that reverence that the fear of the Lord represents. And it's, it's this fear that is the prerequisite to seeing the goodness of God. 
That's the way Paul talks about it in this song. You want to receive the goodness of God, you want to bless Him and receive His refuge, then you must fear the Lord. However, God's goodness is, is directed to those who fear Him by providing them with a refuge that is, again, not free from trouble. Remember the experiences that led to this song. David feared Saul. He ran from him. David feared the Philistines. He ran from them too. There's legitimate fear in these powerful earthly forces, but the fear of the Lord does not drive us away, but actually brings us to. It brings us to God and provides us protection and salvation. He testifies, verse 4, I sought the Lord and He delivered me from all of my fears. Again, you fear the Lord, you're delivered from all your fears. He goes on to state in verse 7, The age of the Lord encamps around who? Those who fear Him. And then He rescues them. Verse 9, again, O oh, fear the Lord, you His saints. For to those who fear Him, there is no want. Now again, I keep reminding us, He's sitting in a cave writing these verses. Who do you think has want? David has want. Like, do you think there's a mini bar in there? A couple of cold ones in there and a few hot wings? No. He's saying, listen, you fear the Lord, you're not going to want. Verse 11, come you children, listen to me, and I will teach you how to fear the Lord. Fearing God is inextricably bound up with experiencing His salvation and His protection. So there's two things I would like to look at as we talk about the fear of the Lord, about turning to God for your salvation. The first of this is, is, is obvious, so obvious that we have to state it. The fear of God is learned. Or probably a better way to say it, the fear of God is taught and then learned. Notice verse 11, we just quoted it. Come, O children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The point is that the fear of God, the, the embracing of God as a holy reverence for God, uh, seeing God as the holy other, it, it does not come naturally to us. It's something that's learned by us. Again, remember when we were in Romans 1? One of the things that Paul kept reminding us is that there's that human tendency to not fear God, to actually make Him manageable, right? What we do is we pull God down and we make Him like us. And Paul says we make Him into images. Even images of crawling things, insects, bugs, little lizards, frogs, etc., etc. We want to make God familiar, manageable, controllable by me, right? And what David is saying, listen, no, no, here's, here's the thing. That's our natural tendency. And if you want to battle that natural tendency, you have to teach the fear of the Lord. You have to teach the greatness of God, His holiness, His wonder, His awe. Make God great again. That's, that was for <laughs> Make God big again, the way He is projected in Scripture. And you do that by teaching the big doctrines, not just the easy ones. Parents, don't just teach your kids that God is love. Don't just teach them that He is patient and gracious. Teach them, teach them that He is holy. Teach them that He is immutable. Teach them that He absolutely hates sin and that He is a God of wrath. And guess what? Then when you teach them that God is love, they will be struck with awe. A loving God without wrath is just Santa Claus. A God of grace and compassion without holiness and righteousness and hatred for sin is just their favorite aunt and uncle or grandpa. Teach your kids to fear the Lord because the psalm says in fearing the Lord they'll find refuge when they find trouble. And your kids are going to find trouble. And when they find that they fear the Lord they will find refuge. And when they find refuge they will bless the Lord. Isn't that what you want for your kids? You can't protect them from trouble, but you sure can give them a place to go when they find it. But you've got to teach it to them. Second thing, we need to understand, and this is part of teaching it, how the fear of the Lord looks in your life. It's what, it's, you need to teach the big doctrines, the great things of God. 
but you also need to teach your kids what that looks like, how, how you live the fear of the Lord out. That's verses 13 and 14. That the fear of the Lord is, is not just about what you believe about the greatness and bigness of God. It's about how that, that faith in God works itself out in the day-to-day -day study. He teaches us, essentially, that the fear of the Lord is not just a white tower, theological, academic discussion that those of us with PhDs teach to you little low folk. Okay, that's not what it is. The fear of the Lord involves acting consistently with God's character and His commands. We must live in a way that reflects the reality that we have abandoned ourselves and that we now live by faith in Jesus Christ. The fear of the Lord involves doctrine and its implementation. It's like James says in James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. It's meaningless. There, there's nothing there. David teaches us that the fear of the Lord is manifested in very practical ways. By contrast, David states verse 16. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Further in verse 21, affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. So either God's eyes are towards us favorably because we fear Him and obey Him, that's verse 15, or His face is against us because we disobey Him, that's verse 16 and 21. But let's make sure that we get the order right. Please get the order right. It's not obey the Lord leads to fearing Him. It's fear the Lord leads to obeying Him. Fearing God, submitting to Him by faith comes first, and obedience is the fruit of your faith-filled life. Fearing God leads to obeying Him, which leads to enjoying God, which leads to experiencing His blessings. That's the way it works. So at this point, I think it's important for us to pause and to ask the question, how did David get to this point where he could teach us these things about the fear of the Lord? How, how did he get to this point? What, what was it that caused David to turn to God and then say, listen, I want you to follow my example, follow my footsteps? Well, I think it's, it's quite simple, actually, because it's the same for David as it is for everybody else. It's until you sit in the cave, until you realize you're broken beyond your own ability to fix, until you realize that you will never be saved from your fears, afflictions, cries, and troubles by anything that you can do. You will never cry out to God for salvation. Until you come to the end of yourself, you will never cry out to God. As long as you think, even a little bit, that your goodness, your works, stuff you can generate on your own is going to be enough to save you, Enough to pull your life back together. Enough for you to see victory. Uh, enough for you to find refuge in yourself. You will never see God as what you actually need. You'll never see yourself as that poor man that David sees himself as. Look at verse 6. You'll never see yourself as someone who needs deliverance. As he says in verse 4. You'll never see yourself as somebody who needs the protection of the Lord and camping around them because you think you can handle everything yourself. And so as our eyes are open to the seriousness of our sin and the immensity of our inability, and as soon as we begin to understand that, that our circumstances, trials, and tribulations will always overwhelm us if we stand against them by ourselves, we will never be driven to God, to the cross. Now David may have hid in the cave of Adullam from Saul and the Philistines, but in his heart, in his heart, where was he hiding? He was hiding in God. Verse 8, that was his refuge and his strength. And so the question then becomes for us, are we like David? Uh, do we come, are we at the place of feeling broken and crushed by our sin and our inability? So that God can then camp around us. Are, are you, uh, let me just say it this way. Are you sick and tired of always being um, subject to your circumstances? Up, down, up, down, up, down. 
Are, are you tired of always losing to your trials and your troubles? To always being defeated by your circumstances? Are you to the point where you're ready to cry out to God? Because you need to become poor. You need to recognize your inability. You need to recognize that you need to be defended. And it's at that moment when you cry out to God that He comes to you in Jesus Christ. And He encamps around you. And He delivers you. Third thing that David teaches us. Godliness is a community project. I'm not really sure how else to say this. It's a community project. It, it involves the group. It involves a group of believers coming together and being committed to living a certain way together, with each other. Uh, God, essentially, what David is saying is that God wants us to share our experiences with God and the blessings of God with those around us. So share those verse 4 to 7 moments with people around you. You know, here was my situation. I sought the Lord. He delivered me. I, I was poor and unable, and I was at the wit's end, and I cried out, and God came to me, and He saved me. Uh, I, I, the Lord encamped around me in this circumstance. So guess what? Let's bless the Lord together. <coughs> That's essentially what Paul is saying, or David is saying, Paul. I've been preparing for Romans, so if I go back before, forgive me. That's essentially what he's saying. You remember, the Psalms are not just personal reflections on God by the authors intended to be read by yourself on your own. They're intended to be uh, sung in the assembly, read in the assembly, participated in as a group in the assembly as an act of worship. And the, the entire Psalm of 34 essentially repeats the theme, I've received some blessings from God and you can too. I want you to. I invite you to. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, with me. Let us exalt His name together. Uh, in verses 4 to 10, the idea is that, listen, God rescued me, He can rescue you too. And so the invitation comes to us in verse 8, blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. It's given to all of us who, who will need refuge. Those who are exhorted to taste and see that the Lord of good, is good are not pagans. Right? This is not an evangelistic message that, that David is giving out. This is not unbelievers that he's saying, hey, taste and see that God is good. No, he's saying to believers. He's exhorting all of us inside the covenant people of God. I want you to worship with me. I want you to exalt his name. I want to hear your experiences. These are my experiences Bless the Lord, exalt His name. Now let me hear your experiences so I can bless the Lord with you based on what God has done for you. It's all God-focused, but it comes from the community of God's people sharing together, getting together and, and communicating where they have received the refuge of God. Don't just look on, he says. Don't just wish that what you have can be yours. No, no, taste it for yourself. See, praise is meant to be shared. Praise is meant to be shared. What you've experienced with God is meant to be shared with other people. When you're up, when you're down, when you're struggling, when you're winning, when you're battling, it's all meant to be shared. And what I, I let, let me just explain what I don't mean. What I don't mean is that we have some sort of to call the Mennonite weddings when they open the mic, Trivilegus, or whatever it is, right? And that, come on, we're never doing that here. Right? We're not just going to have a parade of people, so tell me about your experiences with the Lord this week. And then you get up there and share, and then we just get this sort of conveyor belt of people. That's not what it is. What it is, is in the fellowship of God's people, we're involved in discipleship with each other. We're involved in each other's life. Not just going for coffee, not just going for wings, not just having a, a general mom's morning out where we can, our kids can play together and we can find some relief? No, the point that David is trying to make is that, listen, you have experiences of God working in your life where you have abandoned yourself and you've gotten small and he's gotten big and I want to hear about that because I want to bless the Lord for what he's doing in your life. 
Not just for what he's doing in mine, but in yours. And you know what? We all know this. Your experiences can encourage and challenge me. Because human experience is largely the same. We might not go through exactly the same things, but man, if I know that you're winning in this area, then man, that encourages me. Right? Think about it this way. This is going to be a pathetic illustration. It's going to tell you how pathetic I am as a human being. My mood changes on a Sunday afternoon based on how the Denver Broncos are doing. I'll admit it. My wife has often said, we can't have church people over to watch football with you. You know, and I know there's enough football fans in here. I know, right? I don't text Stu when the Packers are losing. I don't text, oh, I don't text Brandon when Tom Brady leaves the Patriots. They're going 6 and 10 this year, Max. <laughs> right? There's certain things that I know you don't do. My moods go up and down with my team. Now, think about it this way. When you hear about God working in the life of another person, that should really skyrocket you. Like, are you telling, are you telling me you're getting victory over that? Are you telling me that, that God delivered you from that? That is amazing. I will bless the Lord with you. I will exalt His name together with you. That's what David wants from us. Share what God is doing in your life. Share your journey of faith. I can't believe I used that phrase. Share where you've experienced the deliverance of Jesus from sin and death in your life. Share it with your kids. Share, your, share it with your co-workers. Share it with your neighbors. Share it with unbelievers. See, as Christians with unbelievers, we don't need, um, you know, four spiritual laws. I mean, I know that dates me. We don't need an evangelism course. We just need to be bubbling over with our experiences of what God has done in our life. And we praise Him and worship Him as we live and move and have our being wherever it is. And we share what God has been doing in our life with everybody around us. And what Jesus Christ has done to apply His victory over sin into our life. So this kind of blessed life is a community life. We live it together. Last thing, fourth thing, fourth perspective that David wants us to have. There is going to be ultimate deliverance from your trials. You will get to a point one day where your trials will end. There will be a day when your life will be 100% blessing, 100% refuge, 100% encampment, and 0% trouble. But... That's going to happen in the next one. It's not going to happen now. Verses 19 to 22 communicate this to us. The ultimate deliverance for all of God's people is beyond death. When God will finally justify His people and condemn the wicked. Evil will overcome the wicked. They will perish, as we've already quoted in verse 21. In contrast, the godly will find the Lord to be faithful even in their death. Those who trust in Him, verse 22 says, will not perish. And these verses make obvious what the Scriptures teach throughout them, that there is a great divide between those whom God redeems and those whom God will condemn. But we must wait until the end for that divide to become a reality. Now please take note of something which is very important to the teaching of the psalm right at the very end in verses 21 and 22. The same word for the same word condemned is used in verse 21 and 22 about two different groups of people. We're told in verse 21 that the wicked will be condemned. We're told in verse 22 that those who take refuge in God will not be condemned. Now remember, how do, they, how do they get refuge? Because they have feared the Lord. The word condemned assumes guilt in both cases. It means essentially to be held guilty. David intends for us to understand that both the wicked and the righteous are guilty. The wicked and the righteous are held guilty. In the one instance, the guilty are held to be guilty and are punished for their sins. But in the other instance, in verse 22, those who find refuge in God, they are redeemed 
and not punished, though they are guilty. And the reason why some are forgiven and others are not is simply because God has taken them in. Those who are brokenhearted and crushed in spirit are the ones who find refuge in God, while others stubbornly resist God and hate the righteous. Notice also the word redeems in verse 22 because it suggests that the forgiveness of those who take refuge in God is not without cost. Everybody in the Old Testament knew this. From the New Testament we know that we are redeemed not by the shedding of the blood of animals at the Passover or, or by really good obedience to the law, but only on account of the shed blood of Christ. The important thing to remember is that some of us are saved not because we are righteous, not because we have done anything, not because we have made ourselves acceptable and then God comes to us. No. We are saved because we have been redeemed. Because Christ has redeemed us. And therefore we are forgiven and no longer held accountable for our sins on account of what God has done for us. Those who are saved, have their sins paid for by another. And only those who are made saints and declared righteous by the finishing work, finished work of Jesus Christ, becoming their work, will find blessing in this life and will find deliverance and refuge in the life to come. So here we are at the end of this song, and we hear the faint echoes of John chapter 10, where Jesus himself says, I have come to you that you may have life, that you may enjoy life, that you may have life in abundance, that you have life so much that it overflows, that it bubbles over at every point in your life. We hear the echoes of Jesus' words in, in Matthew chapter 11 when he says, Come to, a, to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's David's invitation. Come to the Savior. The invitation stands to us. Come to Jesus. Taste and see that He is good. Come with your cries. Come with your poverty. Come with your troubles. Come with your trials. Come with your suffering. Come to Him when you're sitting in a cave all by yourself, fearing for your life. Because it's the only place where you are going to find blessing. It's the only place where you are going to find peace. It's the only place where you are going to find protection. It's the only place where you're going to find satisfaction. And this is a message for believer and unbeliever alike. If you're here today, you've never met God in Jesus Christ, seek refuge in Him. Seek refuge in Jesus Christ. He is the Redeemer and Savior on account of His sacrificial death on the cross. And as I've said, your troubles aren't going to go away, but suddenly they will mean something. You will be protected, and you will find security and refuge in the midst of them. And as believers, this is the same message for you. Stop trying to battle Saul on, the, on your own. Stop trying to flee the Philistines by yourself. Stop trying to defeat whatever trials and troubles and tribulations come your way. Let God take over. My prayer for all of you is that you will come to fear God as you ought to. And that that fear of the Lord will lead you to live it out and to share it with others. So that together we can gather and bless the Lord at all times exalt his name together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message of this song of David. We thank you for the reminder to bless you and exalt you at all times. We thank you for the encouragement and the challenge that we must fear you, that we must teach it to others, that we must embrace it. Lord, thank you for the reminder that we are a believer amongst other believers and there is great encouragement and challenge and, and there's, there's great um, 
learning and growth that can happen as a group as we come together and share what you're doing in our lives. And Lord, thank you for the reminder that you have redeemed us. That though we are sinners, you have clothed us with the cloak of your alien righteousness. And that you are bringing us to a place where one day all of these trials and troubles and poverty and crying and, and all the stuff we battle with will, will one day just completely fall away. And that the refuge we experience in moments today will be a glorified, wonderful experience for all of eternity. Lord Jesus, make us weak in ourselves. Help us to look away from ourselves. Help us to seek refuge only in you. And Lord, make us bold in our witness of what you are doing in our life so that you can do it in the lives of others. We pray this all in Jesus' name.